on the screen. The, the developer knows what controls you want. He, he, he's popped them onto the screen. Now the designer is going to the exercise of taking that and applying the visual design right. to the blend. So for that one, you need much less the developer savvy designer in that the developer work's sort of been laid out in a framework before the designer gets their hands on it. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to know that that's got to be in a button in a group and, a, and all, all that detail. That's all already been done by a developer. They've just got to do their beautifying process. And, and what, when you say beautifying, are we talking about styles here? What, what is that? I mean, arguably that constrains the designer in some way, which may be a good thing. What, what are the what does that beautifying really look like? What, what, what are we talking about? So, you know, for example, if, if, if I take uh, a button, uh, a regular rectangle button, you know, might look like something like this. But if we're creating quite a, you know, a visually wow application, our button, you know, might be a custom shape, it might be a rounded button that has a, you know, perhaps a kind of a glow that appears in the top, and then when you put the mouse over it, you know, perhaps in more glow kind of emanates from, from within, within the button outwards. So it's about you know, taking the elements that are on the screen and applying a theme and a, and a visual presence to those elements that are beyond just right. what the vanilla controls look like. And what in WPF are you using to do that? Are we talking about styles? Is that what we're talking about? We're talking about, yeah, uh, so there's a whole mechanism in WPF for changing the way things look and behave. There's styles and templates. Templates are uh, really what makes up a control. So for a standard button, a template might be a rectangle and then a text, a, a piece of text in the middle. That would be the template for this button. The template for this button might be a circle uh, with another circle creating a glow and then some kind of special effect which is going to create an outer glow. And I think. So the template has actually become a little more complicated but at the same time looks a lot better. What styles then do is you can use styles to set certain properties of controls and things that exist in Xamarin. So I might have a style that says uh, uh, I, want, I want to set, I want to ensure that all the text that appears in this button is white. So I would use a style to put to set the text of this button to always be drawn in white. And when you mouse over it, you can turn red, and you can do that with the style. That's right. And yes, and when I mouse over it, I'll text turn red. So I use the style to create a setter. Will turn the text red within the button. Right. So okay. there's, there's two separate things, styles and templates, but they work hand in hand. Okay. All right. So that, that sounds good. Um, I, I, I can actually kind of tell you a problem that we found with this particular workflow, though. Um, so one of them is obviously the developer knows what controls are on the page, uh, and he's now writing his C sharp against the controls that he's popped on the page. One of the problems you might see is that a designer who's we, you know, we specify it doesn't have to be a dev savvy designer. Might think, oh, I'm not keen on that button being there. Simply delete the button and perhaps draw another button elsewhere. Now, of course, the developer is actually writing code against that button or against that list box. Mm. Uh, now, of course, that means that if the button's not there, something's going to break. The mm. project is, is, isn't going to run. So that's one problem that we uh, envisage with this. Another one was actually a, a, an example that me and Paul suffered. It actually took us a couple of hours of, of real head scratching oh, yes. before we worked out what happened. But uh, <laughs> we, we created a video player, uh, a piece of user interface, uh, and we'd handed it over to the designer to add some visual, uh, some kind of visual wow to it. We kind of rounded some corners and put some nice gradients in the video panel. But at the same time, he wanted to see the video in the middle of this video panel represented is a black rectangle for its kind of I'm not playing state. So in the UI, he simply drew a black rectangle in place of where the video was. Doesn't sound too bad. When he checked in his design and handed it back to us and we ran the application to test it, we were wondering why we couldn't see the video. Uh, we could hear the sound coming through the speakers, so we knew that the video was playing, but we couldn't for the life of us, you know, think why we, you know, why the video had vanished. And that's a very common problem with the early bits of WPF was that when a video didn't want to play, it played out as a black rectangle. So that was a very, it just looked like, oh, we've hit that button again. Now, why have we hit that button again? We, st we started blaming the technology, didn't yes. we? And kind of stamping off it going, oh, this is <laughs> some rubbish. And then somebody found a black rectangle and deleted it. Yeah, found the rectangle and deleted it, and all of a sudden the video reappeared. So, uh, so yeah, they can really mess the designs up. If right. <laughs> so again, really the key here is that designers have got to be 
or aware of you know WPF and, yeah. and, and what's going on. Yeah. So the, I think it was the fourth one you mentioned. Is there a fourth one you mentioned? That's right. The fourth one, and probably the one that works uh, the best for us in terms of um, you know what we're uh, the, the way that we're approaching projects now. So we start off in a in a similar way. We've user experience team produces some uh, wireframes, which we then pass off to the developer. We then start to draw the layout of the script. Now, at the same time, a designer will take those wireframes and then a separate project, so this is now separate from the actual project that we're producing here, will begin to look at the wireframe and then in a similar way produce styles and templates um, for these controls. So we have a style, a template, and perhaps another style. What the designer will then do is he'll package these up in what WPF calls a resource dictionary, which is like a, um, a CSS style sheet for WPF, mm -hmm. a place where you can put in a whole bunch of visual, re it doesn't have to be visual resources, it could be data resources, um, different types of brush, but a whole, one, uh, a whole collection of resources in one big .xaml file. And you know, each of these will have a, a key, so you know, the developer will be able to see what this, this, that this resource relates to this control and this resource relates to this control. So this is what the designer is doing. The designer then passes that resource dictionary to the developer. And they use it like as a tool bag. Right. Just sort of pick things out of the tool bag and just say, well, I'm going to want a pink button here, or we've got pink buttons somewhere, and this goes through the resource dictionary. Gotcha. Pulls that pink button and hand cranks the XAML and, or, you know, actually applies all the styles that have been developed in Blend to the various elements right. in the user interface. And this goes back to your earlier point about, actually, yes, you can do some freeform design, but you need to break it down into small components and, and put them in a resource dictionary so that, you know, they still make some sense to the developer rather than being some enormous great big chunk of That's right. yes. you know, XML fundamentally. And, and the enormous great chunk of XML can quite happily sit in a resource dictionary Mm. And you can, in the design, you can collapse it all up into just line of stuff, line of stuff, line of stuff, and lots of lines of things. And you can actually see the resources fairly well, um, but you don't have to actually understand any of the sound. And that keeps all the all the clutter out in the resource dictionary, and keeps mm. you can keep this main sound file quite clean. Then. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The sound file just has two buttons and a, a list box. It doesn't have all the additional drawing information that it requires to decide what they're going to look like. That all sits in this separate file. Now the downside of this one <laughs> is uh, you've, got to, you've got to get quite clever in how you break up your resource dictionary, otherwise you're going to get contention if you've got multiple designers. Because everybody wants to edit the resource dictionary because all the SAML's in there. Uh, so you've really got to come up with a higher, you know, it's very flexible, you can, you can divide it up however you want to do, but again, the more you divide it up, the harder it is to find things. So, you know, it's the same problem with style sheets, really. I mean, that was one of the nice things with um, with these toolbars that you can get for browsers, is you can actually see which style is uh, working on which uh, on which element, you know, whereas it's not that easy now. Right, okay, got you. But you're saying this is, this is the, t the approach you two typically take now mm -hmm. with, with your projects, is that? You found yes. this kind of a good balance between all different. Absolutely, I've, I've just finished a project where I was actually taking more of a developer role, uh, working with somebody who was more of a traditional designer, um, and for us, this worked absolutely perfectly. Um, right. Okay. It, Sounds good. It, it meant that the uh, the code that was actually going into the application uh, remained kind of owned by me, and I could manage and, and continue to look after that and make mm. sure that it continued to perform. And the designer was still able to produce. Uh, assets and, and, and visual styles. Uh, with so you were playing more of a developer role there, were you? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And presumably this also overcomes one of the challenges that I, I see is uh, that of source code control. And obviously at the moment, Blend, you know, this current version of Blend doesn't have uh, source code control. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how does it work in? You know, you, you follow this sort of workflow, but in a big project where you've got a number of developers and designers, any Anything you found that, that kind of works? How do you do source code control? I mean, 
you know, if you're if you're the designer. Well, again, the the resource dictionary merges quite well. So if you've got multiple people on it, they tend to be working on different parts of the resource dictionary. So when you merge it in the merge, as long as you understand what merging is, which again, designers possibly aren't familiar with these sort of tools. Um, and I'm not detriment of I can't design, so you know they have skills I don't have. So. Um, uh, so you can actually merge these things quite well, so that works works okay. But yeah, really, it's, so it's business as usual. Really. You've just got to break it down into sensible components that people can find a way around. Really. So I, th I think um, so far as managing source, um, I think any designer who's going to start looking at uh, creating and designing WPF applications should probably download Visual Studio anyway. Uh, begin to really look at the XAML in Visual Studio and begin to understand you know, what it is that's being produced behind the scenes of what Blend is, is creating. So I think, yeah, on top of it there would be that to download Visual Studio anyway, and then if you're using source control, you can manage your source control through Visual Studio, but at the same time have the project open in Blend, so I can check out a file in Visual Studio, yeah. switch to Blend, do the work, and check it back into Visual Studio. Or, right. of course, if uh, Visual Studio is not available, whatever source control tool they use whether it's uh, Visual Source Safe or. I was going to say, I think you can get um, a standalone uh, client, can't you, for Team System? Yeah. Um, so I guess you could be using that as well. It actually bases itself on the yeah. Studio, but yeah. Absolutely. So, so another interesting thing that occurs to me with, all, with, with this whole area is um, you know, fine, we're just piecing together the UI, uh, this all works very nicely, but you know, actually, an application. To be involved a little bit more than just the UI, you know, to be involved with um, data, um, you know, database, a data access tier, mid tier, whatever um, the structure, the whatever the architecture is. Um, as the application progresses, uh, you know, a designer wants to see a representation of real data. So does the developer of the UI as well. Uh, what are our options there in terms of, you know, I mean, we hear a lot about the great power of data binding in WPF. <laughs> how does that all? How does that work in in, in practice? Well. Um, so with WPF, yeah, it's got a whole bunch of really uh, neat data binding uh, stuff that's kind of built in right out of the box. So a quick example would be yeah. you could, you could um, uh, say you've got a, a, te a list of uh, numbers, you could create a, a button, um, pretty, pretty hard, but create a rectangle whose width is the, width and the size of the, all the numbers in the list. And you just do a data binding expression, you just put something like a rectangle, um, rectangle width equals, and then you put in quotes, you just start the word binding, and then you put the name of the variable that you want to bind to, and you create a whole list of rectangles, one with all, all of each width. So that's almost, you want, just for that one line, you've almost written a bar chart. Control mm -hmm. straight off the back. You've now got coloured rectangles, one for each number right. and chart. And so what about powerful? And what about you know? Do you think, I mean, a lot of people are familiar with you know list boxes. You know, um, just, just binding that to some data. And yeah, again, if you're familiar with ASP.NET data binding and list boxes and things like that, and ASP.NET, very similar concepts. So the the skills definitely transfer forward into mm -hmm. uh, WPF. So yeah, so, so for us designers, um, Blend actually has some really, really good support for data binding. It's very easy to do something like this where we've taken a property of a rectangle and bound that to a property of something else. Um, you can do that with, with UI, can't you? There's, there's, there's UI. There's dialogues and stuff to do that. Isn't Absolutely. It? And there's also a user interface to bring in data from external sources as well. So, so from RSS feeds and things like RSS that. RSS feeds, exactly. So to, back, to go back to your original question. Is yeah, I'm, I'm, sorry, Dave, just, just jumping in. I'm, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the developers been chugging away the, you know, on, the, on the back end of the system. And uh, here you go, here, here's an object. This is my, my collection class, my collection of, I don't know, what are items uh, they're going to be. And you now have to present those, that, that collection of items in a list box. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how am I going to do that? I mean, can I do that? In, can I do that in Blend? Yeah, it's very, again, it's very similar to the way you do in ASP.NET. You have a, a bit like a repeater. You just have a uh, an items template that just specify the XAML that you want repeat.